Okay, lecture one, uh, introduction to protocols. And we're just going to begin by uh, taking care of a few basic patient care uh, thoughts. And that will comprise basically the first uh, lecture in this class. So let's first begin by talking about consent. Uh, the patient is required to provide informed consent before the start of any invasive procedure. So there's two types of consent, informed and implied consent. So the first topic is going to be informed consent. And we see that only when the procedure has been fully explained and the patient fully comprehends it can informed consent be given. Uh, we have to include such things to the patient as the risk, the benefits, the alternatives, and we also have to answer any questions that they have. It's what the name implies, informed consent. The patient has to be able to make a very informed decision that they want to have this procedure done. So that is informed consent. Uh, implied consent, on the other hand, occurs when a patient is in need of an immediate medical services but is unconscious or is physically unable to consent for treatment. Uh, this happens in such things as trauma or um, such things as um, C CVA, um, uh, such things like that, to where the patient may not be them at themselves. Uh, if you have had a horrific car accident and you're completely unconscious and everyone around you is unconscious, uh, then the medical team is going to make uh, decisions based on what you would do if you had the ability to say or consent to it. And so uh, they're going to take life-saving measures that are needed because they feel that you would do the same if you were uh, aware of what was going to be done. And uh, the key thing is believed to be what the patient would do if physically able. Uh, so uh, if you have uh, trauma and you're having internal bleeding, uh, then, and, but you're unconscious, then the medical team would take you in for exploratory surgery to stop the internal bleeding because it's something that you would do if you were able to say that you would. That's very important. Uh, so that brings us to immobilization. As we all know, uh, mobilization uh, takes various forms and roots, uh, but we also know that patient motion is very detrimental to CT. Uh, the difference between a good exam and a bad exam can simply be the result of patient motion. Uh, you can have excellent factors, excellent technique, excellent uh, everything. You can have the perfect contrast bolus, but if you have patient motion, then everything just kind of goes out the window. So in order to decrease the amount of motion in CT, manufacturers include a variety of cushions, straps, and other safety devices that may be carefully utilized to help the patient hold still. Uh, many times we see that these are not strict, rigid things that completely eliminate motion from the patient, but also it's uh, rather it's to remind the patient that you need to hold still, you don't need to move, you need to do this or that. Also, uh, the breath hold is another form of patient immobilization uh, that's required during many CT exams. A lot of people don't uh, think that the breath hold is actually a form of immobilization, but it actually is. And so uh, all of this helps to function together to provide an adequate exam uh, that will be of some diagnostic benefit to the patient. So another thing that we have to focus on is vital signs. Uh, not always will we be having to take uh, or worry about vital signs, but it, it kind of helps us paint a whole entire picture of the patient. Also, number one, uh, body temperature normally is 97.5 to 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we always think of 98.6 as being the normal. However, uh, you can actually go up 0.9 or 9 tenths of a degree Fahrenheit and still be within the normal range or lower as well. Uh, pulse rate for an adult is 60 to 100 beats per minute or BPM. Uh, infants uh, has a more rapid heartbeat, uh, usually around 70 to 120 beats per minute. All of this is within the normal range. Uh, blood pressure, systolic, uh, which we define as being the contraction phase of the heart, uh, should be less than 120 millimeters of mercury or HG. And the diastolic pressure should be less than 80 millimeters of mercury. Uh, so uh, we always have systolic over diastolic. And so you, that, that's how we typically view the blood pressure. Uh, blood oxygen levels are another important thing. 
And this can be uh, typically more indicative of where our patient is heading. Um, if you have uh, a patient who is uh, very using very shallow respirations, things like that, then it becomes necessary to actually look at what the blood oxygen levels are. Uh, and so that can be very detrimental or indicative of where your patient is heading while they're in the CT suite. Uh, we typically want blood oxygen levels to be 95% to 100. Uh, you typically want them to at least be in the 90s. If they drop below the 90s, then uh, things such as BiPAPs, and then if they drop even further than uh, 80s, uh, then such things as uh, endotracheal tubes, uh, trachs, things like that are inserted to help the patient breathe more efficiently. Uh, so all of these things typically will be uh, something that we may actually have to deal with in terms of CT. Another thing is the EKG. Uh, typically, we're wanting to see how the heart is functioning, uh, and while the EKG may not be necessary for us to learn how to do, it is uh, essential for us to know what EKG waves actually look like, and and in doing so, learn about them so that if we have to do exams such as uh, cardiac gating, things like that, that actually scan when the heart is at a certain level, then it will be more effective for us and will yield a better examination for the patient. Uh, so there's three things that you want to look out for. There's the P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave. The P wave is the atrial contraction. The QRS complex is the ventricular contraction. And the T wave is atrial and ventricular. So keep those in mind uh, that you're going to have uh, these three complexes or three waves. And so let's look at that. Uh, here's what an EKG wavelength would look like. Uh, as we can see, we have uh, the P wave here, the QRS complex here, and then we have the T wave. And so uh, there's three areas. Um, this is atrial. This is for your ventricles and this is for relaxation. And so notice something here that uh, the, the QRS complex is very uh, short and abrupt and it, it reaches a higher peak and that is because when, they, when the ventricles contract, they have to contract with such force to expel the blood and pump it to either the pulmonary arteries or to the aorta. And so it's very necessary for there to be a rapid, uh, forceful contraction. And that's what we're looking for here. So that brings us to the big thing, contrast. Uh, it's something that you're going to deal with on a daily basis. Um, and it's, it's a very important part of CT. Um, it's what really makes CT tick. So there has to be two reasons for contrast usage. Uh, number one is to label bowel or blood vessels in order to identify them and to assist in distinguishing normal structures from abnormal. So that's what we're typically looking for, how to distinguish normal from abnormal structures. Uh, number two is to enhance the image contrast difference between a lesion and the normal background tissue in which it arises. So it kind of makes things jump out that may ne not necessarily be that distinguishable. And so that's the two things that we're typically looking for with contrast injection. And I know sometimes it kind of gets skewed where we just do contrast for everything. Uh, but typically these have to be the two reasons why we want to use contrast. Uh, a lot of times contrast just kind of gets overlooked or overlooked or, uh, or just kind of discounted because it's something that people naturally think has to be part of CT. But there has to be good reason and smart usage for this. It is important, though, uh, that it is not to, to know that it is not in the nature of the bowel that orally administered contrast should distribute itself uniformly through the whole length of the small and large bowel. We kind of take that for granted that if we have a patient drink a, uh, a set amount of fluid, that the contrast is just naturally going to distribute itself throughout evenly and look all nice and, and proper when we actually do the scan. That's not the way it usually goes. Also, uh, there's no guarantee that lesions are going to be more conspicuous or look any differently after intravascular contrast agent administration is used 
than it was before. And so uh, we kind of bank on those things that the bowel is going to look so much more distinguishable and we're going to have a nice even coating and that if there's any lesions they're going to just jump out at us because of the contrast enhancement. However, this is not the case. Uh, we have to realize that uh, this, is, this is medicine. This is not something that is always set in stone. Uh, that's why the practice of medicine is referred to as practicing medicine because there's always new things. Things don't always behave the same way. And so there's always differences. And because of that, we see that even in CT, we have vast differences in the way things perform. So if we look at uh, contrast, we first begin with the bowel contrast agents. Uh, it's very important that we actually look at what makes all of this work. We see that bowel contrast agents can, can either be positive or negative agents. And so we'll go over what positive and negative are, but let's first begin with positive contrast agents. And they're either defined as barium suspensions or iodinated agents. Uh, and when we refer to positive, it means that they basically increase the density. And so uh, they make things appear different than what uh, typically the bowel would. It makes them highlight more. The behavior of barium suspensions is pH dependent and have and the pH varies throughout the gastrointestinal tract. And so that's one flaw of barium. Uh, so keep that in mind that barium is pH dependent. And so that as we know that the bowel has different levels of pH, it can make the barium behave very differently. Water soluble iodinated agents are more commonly used, and we see that this is gastrographin. Uh, things like this, which have organically bound iodine in a form of a liquid. Uh, they have some peristaltic effect, and this tends to lead to a more homogeneous coating property. And so that's typically what we're looking for. We're wanting um, a very even like coating throughout the intestines, and so water-soluble iodinated contrast tends to lead us there better. Unlike barium suspensions, iodinated X-ray contrast agent solutions are safe if there is a bowel pathology or perforation. That's another thing to keep in mind. Uh, you definitely want to, um, let me erase that and highlight this. Uh, you definitely want to remember this. This is very important. Uh, perforations can cause serious problems. Uh, in, and it's very necessary that we actually use the right type of contrast agent. However, if the presence of inflammatory bowel disease is even uh, is at risk, uh, there is a risk of absorption into the circulation and an, and an adverse reaction. However, uh, if the iodine does get absorbed out of the intestinal tract, uh, then it should be no different uh, than iodine injected through the bloodstream. So if you can tolerate iodine through the bloodstream, then you should be able to tolerate this as well. Uh, patients who have a known iodine allergy should not be given this type of contrast without pre-medication. Uh, we'll see that pre-medication is going to be uh, important. Some, some studies actually uh, discard the effects of pre-medication and say that it's unnecessary while Others tend to indicate that pre-medication is very necessary. And so uh, just patients who have an iodine allergy should be, uh, it should be noted up front and uh, the physician should be notified and allow the physician to determine what the best course of action for this patient. Uh, different physicians believe different things. Some physicians say that uh, we're going to pre-medicate them, uh, give them Benadryl and allow them to do the exam at a later date. Others say that uh, we want the exam right now, and there's really no need in giving them the contrast. We would rather have the images without the contrast than wait another uh, day or two. So it's at the discretion of the physicians. If the contrast mixture is too dense, there is a potential for streak artifacts similar to the artifacts produced when scanning through a metallic object. I'm sure each of us have scanned or saw scans uh, produced when metal is imaged and uh, pretty much disrupts the entire uh, scan. And so uh, if the bowel is too dense, then it automatically becomes um, a hindrance instead of an a, a added bonus that we've used. 
water-soluble water solutions should be heavily diluted, uh, many times on the order of 2%. Uh, so that basically tells us that for 1,000 milliliters of contrast enhanced drink, there should only be around 20 milliliters of the water-soluble contrast actually inside of it. So as we see, uh, you dilute the contrast very heavily uh, because a little bit of it goes a very long way. And so uh, keep that in mind. We're, we're shooting for around 2%. Um, some facilities actually use more, uh, but usually if you're around 2%, you get excellent opacification as well as reducing the effect of strict artifacts. Uh, some radiologists give metoclopramide, uh, 20 milligrams, with oral preparation to speed gastric emptying and to achieve earlier bowel coating. Uh, however, uh, notice that it's some radiologists. It's not really a wide, uh, widely respected technique to give this uh, metoclopramide, uh, but rather uh, just to allow the bowel to actually uh, push the contrast through as it normally would. Uh, barium suspensions are preferred by many and are also given to dil in, in dilute form, uh, mirroring the same ratio as water soluble. So I uh, keep that in mind that the barium solution usually is around 2% as well. Another key point for a lot of facilities is that barium suspensions are much cheaper than water soluble. Uh, so keep that in mind uh, as budgets become a larger issue in departments that barium uh, tends to be on the average very much cheaper and so you honestly get more bang for your buck using barium. A routine transit time for barium through the GI tract is between 30 and 90 minutes. Uh, however, it can take longer um, depending on the way that the patient's bowel is actually empty. Uh, it's contraindicated if there's a, spe a suspected perforation or the patient is due to have surgery in the abdominal or pelvic region. Uh, so keep that in mind that uh, it's going to take, uh, if, if you have a suspected perforation, or even if the patient is going to have surgery in the abdominal or pelvic region, you should not give barium. You should rather favor water soluble. And so uh, there's never going to be a situation to where barium uh, is solely used because water soluble will always have uh, a useful uh, point in times where there could be perforation. And that's one of the things about the bowel. You never know if there's going to be a perforation or not. So before we begin with uh, the IV contrast portion, uh, there's some necessary lab values that we actually have to look at. Um, number one is the BUN, and the normal range is between 7 and 25. However, it's important to note that it's not a sufficient indicator of renal insufficiency. So you can have abnormalities, you can have elevated BUNs, and not actually have any renal insufficiency as, at all. Uh, also keep in mind that BUN stands for uh, blood urea nitrogen levels, and it's just an indicator slightly of how the kidneys are actually removing things from uh, the bloodstream. Creatinine, uh, the normal range is 0 0.5 to 1.5, and we see that it is more informative of renal function. So uh, if you had to choose between BUN and creatinine, uh, then you're typically going to look at the creatinine level uh, as being more indicative of renal function. However, uh, GFR, or the glomerular filtration rate, um, is the most precise indicator that we have of potential renal insufficiency. Uh, it, normal values are um, 70 plus or minus 14 milliliters per minute per meter squared for men and 60 plus or minus uh, 10 milliliters per minute per meter squared uh, for women. And so uh, it basically tells you how much blood is being passed through the kidneys and filtered. And so uh, typically if you have lower amounts of blood being filtered, then you're going to have higher uh, incidences of waste being in the bloodstream. And if you have higher incidences of waste being in the bloodstream, then typically what that means is that 
your kid, your kidneys are not doing a very good job of filtering. And because they're not doing a very good job of filtering, uh, then typically contrast is going to impair that ability even further. Uh, we also have the PT or the prothrombin time, which is a measure of blood coagulation. Normal is 12 to 15 seconds. So keep that in mind that PT is measured in seconds. Uh, it's measured in the lab after the addition of, of a protein called the tissue factor. Uh, and you add this to the, play, uh, to the patient's blood samples. So basically you take uh, a sample of the patient's blood, add this uh, tissue factor in, and then see how long it takes for coagulation to occur. Uh, we also have the INR, which compares a patient's PT with a control sample for a more accurate results. Uh, we don't want the results to be skewed, but we want to compare it against a known quantity, a known sample, to see if there's something wrong with our lab values. And so the normal range is between 0 0.8 to 1.2. And so it uh, has to be very close to what the lab value actually is. Uh, PTT, which is the partial thromboplastin time, it's a little different than the PT, but also still indicative of coagulation. And normal ranges for it are 25 to 35 seconds. The platelet count is used to assess the patient's clotting ability as well. A normal is between 140,000 to 440,000 per millimeters uh, cubed of blood. However, uh, you also might see that it, it sometimes gets abbreviated 440 or 140 to 440 uh, on some laboratory values. And so uh, it's all telling you the same thing. Lastly is the D-dimer, and it's used to demonstrate a potential degrading clot in the bloodstream. Um, I'm sure we've all become familiar with the presence of D-dimers and um, the fact that most of the time an elevated D-dimer strikes fear in uh, many of the physician's hearts and how it prompts many to order uh, pulmonary embolism studies in terms of CT. Uh, I, I, I want to just throw this out there though that the D-dimer is a very inaccurate test. Um, it's on the verge, on the same levels as the CA-125 test uh, that sometimes gets employed to see if a patient has cancer or not. Uh, uh, D-dimer typically will give you elevated um, false positive results. Uh, I've seen many times where uh, I've performed pulmonary embolism studies and CT on patients who have elevated D-dimers and typically they're always negative. Uh, so D-dimer is just used to demonstrate a potential degrading clot, not that there is a clot at some point, but that there could be potentially a clot. Uh, so we have to look at the other values as well as like INR, PT, uh, PTT to actually see if there could be this abnormality to see if the patient is at risk for developing a blood clot somewhere. So let's just begin with a generalized overview of what contrast enhancement actually means. Uh, typically this word gets kind of thrown around a lot. Um, and typically what we mean by contrast enhancement is uh, that it's used to pacify the bowel, oral and rectal agents, and to better demonstrate arteries and veins and the organs that they supply. Uh, and that's through the use of injectable IV iodinated contrast mediums. And so uh, when we're talking about uh, contrast enhancement, typically a lot of times it gets thrown around with just IV injections. And so uh, if we're looking at that, uh, the intravascular agents used in routine clinical practice are always iodinated water-soluble x-ray contrast agents. And they can be of the ionic or non-ionic nature. And we see that the use of non-ionic contrast agents tends to be much higher than the use of ionic agents. Uh, non-ionic Agents have been noted to have a lower incidence of significant side effects such as vomiting. Uh, so keep that in mind. We typically want to use non-ionic simply because there's a lower incidence of bad things that can happen to you. Also take notice that there is never a time where there will ever be a barium contrast iodinated agent uh, simply because of the, the problems that barium exists as a non-water soluble contrast. So negative contrast, and we see that it's things like air and water. 
Uh, for abdominal studies such as liver, gallbladder, pancreas, gastrointestinal studies, focal lesion of the kidneys, and CT angiography studies, it's sufficient and perhaps preferable to use just water uh, for patients to drink. Water allows the depicting of the lining of the stomach and bowel in the post-enhancement studies. And so basically, uh, instead of drinking the oral, iodinated, or barium contrast, sometimes uh, drinking things such as water will help uh, allow things to stand out. Water-soluble iodinated solution may be mixed with a carbonated beverage to add negative contrast to the GI tract, improving the demonstration of subtle diseases. And so basically, uh, you add the iodinated water-soluble contrast to a Coke, and then you allow the consumption of it, and it will act as uh, the carbonated beverage will actually employ uh, air in the patient's intestines and actually allow the distinguishing of certain diseases. Air may be administered via enema to insufflate the large bowel to improve image quality during CT colonography. And so if you're doing CT colonography or virtual endoscopy, typically air is used. And uh, many times this is just uh, inserting an enema tip and allowing air to flow into uh, the patient's intestines, which will distend them and allow better visualization for colonoscopy. So, uh, the oral contrast protocol for just uh, CT of the abdomen. Uh, a volume of 300 milliliters contrast agent, diluted solution, and three doses is recommended. Uh, the first cup is drunk uh, 30 minutes before the study at about 100 milliliters. Uh, the second cup, uh, another 100 milliliters is drunk 15 minutes before the study. And the third and final cup, is drunk five minutes before the study. Uh, some suggest laying the patient on the right side for five minutes before performing the scanogram uh, to be useful. And uh, many times this allows the stomach to empty its contents a little more abruptly. Uh, however, one thing to notice here that uh, the time of exam is going to be about 30 minutes. And I, I feel that that's a little bit on the light side. Uh, typically, we usually wait about an hour to allow... Uh, the contrast to actually have crossed over and, and to be where we want it to be. Uh, abdomen and pelvis oral contrast protocol. Uh, we'll see that it's a little different. A minimum of 800 milliliters of contrast agent diluted solution divided into four cups is recommended. Uh, the first cup is to be drunk an hour before examination. The second through fourth cups every subsequent 15 minutes. So uh, after the first hour, after the hour, after they drink the first cup, then at 45 minutes, 30 minutes, and 15 minutes, there will be another cup. Uh, you start examination five minutes after the fourth cup is administered. For pelvic studies, uh, the first dose may be given four to six hours before the examination, but even so, one cannot assume that orally administered contrast agents will have reached the distal bowel by the time of examination. Uh, this is where rectal contrast tends to play a useful role. Many times insufficient efforts is made to optimize examinations of the pelvis that remain potentially among the most difficult of all to interpret by the radiologist. Uh, we have to understand that there is a gray area with uh, pelvic studies that we have to have optimal contrast enhancement uh, typically all the way to the anus. If we don't achieve this, then it makes it very hard to distinguish bowel contents to other things uh, such as um, ovaries, uh, the uterus, and any abnormalities of those structures. And so if that's the case, then typically uh, the exams are not fully interpreted as well as they could be. Uh, one thing to notice here that uh, this is that you can give the first cup uh, four to six hours uh, before you actually begin the exam and then uh, base the second and fourth cups uh, within the last hour to allow the contrast to get where you actually want it to be. However, um, this protocol is a little different. I think every facility kind of has their own specific protocol, the way that radiologists feel that it best demonstrates uh, where 
the contrast needs to be. However, uh, the facility that I, I work at, uh, the contrast protocol that we actually use is uh, 600 milliliters of uh, water soluble contrast enhanced drink and the patient drinks that we wait one hour and then we do another 400 milliliters of contrast enhanced drink um, and then we wait another hour and then uh, we actually scan the patient but before we scan the patient we have them drink a little more about 100 milliliters of contrast enhanced drink to basically um, hot the stomach and the duodenum and so uh, it's kind of up up in the air every facility is just a little different uh, everyone has a little different protocol but uh, typically on my patients uh, when I perform admin pelvises I, I want to give them a little longer time if they're a young patient usually they'll have a very rapid uh, bowel transit time however if they're a little older uh, then typically the bowels may move a little slower uh, so it may be necessary to actually go from uh, after the last cup is consumed actually instead of an hour make it an hour and a half or an hour and 45 minutes in order to actually get a pacification into uh, the rectum and that's very necessary especially among older patients uh, because of the prevalence of uh, colonic cancer and we definitely don't want to miss that so that's very important that we get accurate bowel enhancement so that brings us to intravascular contrast agent administration initial pacification of blood vessels allows for their anatomic visualization and differentiation from surrounding structures over time, the contrast agent is distributed from the vasculature into the ex extravasculature space. Um, this results in differentiation of normal and abnormal soft tissues. As the kidneys excrete the contrast agent, pacification of the renal collecting system occurs as well. And so that's what makes uh, intravascular contrast such uh, an added bonus because you get uh, not only do you get the vasculature but you also get uh, the renal collecting system and then soft tissue structures as well. An important thing to keep in mind is the osmolality uh, which is an important characteristic of an iodinated radiopaque contrast agent. It describes the agent's ability to cause fluid from the outside of the body uh, outside of the blood vessel to move into the bloodstream. Osmolality greatly affects its potential for adverse effects in the patient. And so uh, typically, uh, as we'll see, if you have high osmol osmolality, uh, then that can really affect the patient. The agents that are used are all iodinated benzene ring structures. Uh, the benzene ring, uh, for those who don't know, um, provides great structure and a great uh, stability to the structure so it's a very stable contrast agent. Uh, we do see that intravascular contrast agents may be ionic or non-ionic, monomeric or dimeric. Uh, ionic contrast, uh, salts consisting of sodium and or megalamine. Each molecule of iodinated contrast agent consists of three iodine, iodine atoms when injected into the bloodstream, each molecule disassociates into uh, charged particle into two charged particles uh, or ions. The production of osmotic ions is indicative of high osmolar contrast media, and so because of the disassociation into two uh, instead of not toe here, uh, that's two charged particles, uh, we actually see that it causes blood to come in from the bloodstream. So because of this, it can greatly disrupt things in the body. And some examples are Conray and Hypake. Uh, typically, you don't see many ion ionic contrast agents used any longer. Uh, typically, what we're using now is non-ionic. And these are non-salt chemical compounds that also contain three atoms of iodine per molecule. They don't disassociate in solution. And because of this lack of disassociation, they're referred to as low osmolar contrast media, or LOCM. And this is what we typically are using now. I'm sure each of you have 
some of this in your facility, uh, whether it be OmniPake, IsoView, or OptiRay. And so uh, that's what we're typically using now, and it's very important uh, to use non-onyx so that you have decreased risk to the patients. Uh, once again, non-ionic LOCMs have a very low risk factor. Enhancement of examination is to take to mean simply the administration of intravascular contrast agents. What we seek to achieve by administering a contrast agent is an increase in the different uh, CT numbers between one region and another, between abnormal and abnormal. And so basically what we're trying to do is distinguish between normal and abnormal tissues. There is no certainty that enhancing the scan in the loose sense of the word will lead to enhancement of conspicuity of the lesions suspected. So once again, there is no indication that lesions will enhance uh, greater than what the surrounding tissue will. The crucial question is then considered as to whether protocols need to be adjusted as CT technology becomes faster. Should we use the same or must we use different protocols for multi-slice as opposed to earlier single-slice machines? So the question becomes, because we have newer, faster, better machines, do we need to use less, more? How do we need to inject the contrast? What needs to happen as a result of this? And so that's a question that we will seek to answer throughout uh, all of our lectures and see how we can best demonstrate pathology by using certain scan protocols. So that brings us to patient preparation and drugs. Firstly, emergency imaging and imaging on very ill patients may be performed, of course, without any preparation. In more routine scans, an MPO regimen for at least four hours or so is recommended. Uh, this is beneficial if oral contrast is administered. This is also beneficial with an intravascular contrast agent administration in the case the patient should vomit. And so that's typically what we're worrying about uh, if we're using iodinated IV contrast uh, because basically you don't want the patient to be laying flat on their back and you inject and the patient uh, vomit but not be able to roll over and aspirate and cause serious complications. So we want to we seek to decrease that and that's by keeping the patient MPO. Uh, it should be noted though that vomiting is uh, highly unlikely with the use of non-ionic contrast agents. So typically you're not going to see many reactions due to the fact that you're using non-ionic contrast agents. MPO loosely indicates that no solids or milk products should be consumed uh, before the exam. Many do not include clear liquids in this because dehydration can be detrimental to the patient's renal functions. And so uh, what we see here is that sometimes facilities, uh, based, on, based on your facility actually, um, MPO can mean different things. MPO can mean nothing or MPO can mean clear liquids. Uh, typically, uh, your clear liquids are going to help prevent dehydration because, as we all know, uh, creatinine and GFR levels can be uh, affected by dehydration. And so we want the patient to be as close to optimal health in terms of renal sufficiency as they can be. So the big question is, are there any alternatives to iodine? Uh, you hear a lot of patients, uh, they have this fear of iodinated contrast medium. And uh, the big question is, can I get anything else that will prevent me from having a reaction or something bad? Uh, so we do see that a gadolinium chelate contrast agents designed for use in magnetic resonance imaging have been recommended for use in CT patients at high risk for adverse reactions to iodinated contrast agents. However, uh, we should also say that there is a certain standard of amount that the gadolinium chelate contrast agents are supposed to be injected at. And to achieve adequate dosage for CT, we have to step really way across that boundary and uh, inject higher doses. And because we have to inject higher doses, uh, there could be associated risk with it as well. And not to mention the fact that uh, the gadolinium is much more expensive than the iodinated contrast medium. So uh, virtually, you're not benefiting the patient very much at all either way. And also, uh, it's been shown that 
gadolinium chelate agents. I had the tendency to had predispose a patient to a nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, uh, which is associated with buildup of this contrast agent in relationship with the de decreased renal production. And so basically, if you have an impaired renal functionality, uh, then uh, you can cause nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, which uh, can potentially shut the patient's kidneys down and uh, cause the patient to die. And that's simply because of renal insufficiency that is already underlying, and then you exacerbate it through the use of gadolinium. And so uh, just as there's negative impacts of uh, iodinated contrast medium, there's also negative impacts of gadolinium as well. So it's not to say that one is more safe than the other. Uh, they both have their positives and negatives. And so it's up to the physicians to decide uh, do the risk outweigh the benefits or do the benefits outweigh the, outweigh the risk. And so that's kind of up to their discretion.